Well, the future used to be a thing that's far away. You know, we thought of the future as being science fiction or Perry Roden or Star Trek, you know, like tomorrow. Yeah? But it turns out that the future is, is here today. Right? As William Gibson says, uh, the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. Right? And now because technology has exploded and science has exploded, basically exponentially, 4, 8, 16, we are at the point where the future is no longer something that we think about, it's in our heads. Right? And you can go to Korea or Japan or other places and the future is already here. So this is the point in time where we are going to decide what the future looks like for us, period. You know, in terms of who we are and what other people are. Well, the difference, and, and this is a little bit hard to understand when you're looking at, you know, the human mind is linear. You know, we, we grow one, two, three, four, five, six, and we don't leap, not very often, right? But computers, Moore's law, Metcalfe's law, Wright's law, computers are exponential and science is exponential, right? So at the early point of the exponential scale, right, in the beginning, it looks very much the same than linear. You know, it goes on like 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.04, you know, it goes like this. And then you reach the tipping point, that's four, right, where we're at right now. And then four is really interesting, four, eight, 16. So basically you have this knee of the curve and it goes boom to the sky, right? So if I take 30 steps across the living room here, I end up in the kitchen or in the garage outside, right? But 30 steps exponentially, I end up on the moon. So if you have a short-term view, you look at the beginning of the scale, you say, okay, not much is happening. But when you look at the middle of the scale, it's exploding. And when you look at the top of the scale, it's like a whole unimaginable. Right? So my kids will live in a world that's going to be a thousand eggs as different as what I have now. And the kids of my kids will live in a world that is utterly, completely undescribable because it's a billion. Right? Yes, you know, I'm in the tradition of futurists like Alvin Toffler, Arthur C. Clarke, Marshall McLuhan, Buckminster Fuller, but their issue was, of course, they were in the 70s and 80s, and then the future was pretty far away. So predicting the internet was revolutionary, Arthur C. Clarke did, or Space Odyssey and so on, right? Now, I am here, I'm looking at, okay, the next five to 10 years, they're gonna bring more change than the previous 200 years. That's because our science is so powerful inventing quantum computing, artificial intelligence, genetic engineering, all in the next 10 years. And this is why I say the next 10 years will decide on what we are, because we can finally actually change who we are. So and this is why this time is so different and so important, because if we make the wrong decisions in the next 10 years, we're gonna go take the wrong intersection. And then it's basically, imagine if you go to the moon, you know, 30 steps, and then you decide you, you've gone too far, you want to go back. It's impossible to go back from the moon at step 27. Right? And it's the same thing here. Yes, well, you know, there has been a trend recently because of media and Hollywood and Nollywood and Bollywood and so on, uh, is to describe the future in a dark way, because obviously it's interesting, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, it sells, right? So most people around the world look at the future and they say, well, the future is going to be most likely bad because, you know, the, the robots take our job and then they kill us. Right? And they have a negative view of the future. Uh, and other people are saying, oh, whatever the future is, you know, it will find its own way and I don't really have much input. You know? And that's particularly uh, popular in Europe. You know, we are kind of like, we're very much about the past uh, and the present. And in Germany, there's a saying, you know, the German chancellor once said, I think 20 years ago, that if you have visions, you should go see a doctor, right? And in America, it's the other way around. You don't have visions, you have to go see a doctor, you know, get a prescription of a sort, you know? uh, So that is, the future is not fixed, right? It doesn't fall down on us. It is not inevitable. It's malleable. Whatever I decide now changes our future, right? The way that we act impacts what the future is. And furthermore, the way that we think impacts what actually happens. They're called assumptions. So if you're assuming that your wife is no longer interested in you, you have a different reaction that makes her behave and so on and so on, right? So it's very much the same about the future as we're thinking about the future being bad. We tend to be negative about the changes and then they become bad, right? 
So the future, however, is not fixed. We make it by inaction or by action. You know, we decide it pretty much every minute. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, well, I'm, I'm hopeful about the future because I realize that I make the future. Right? So if you have hope in yourself, that means you could have hope in the future. But I think generally speaking, the, the future is something that we have. We have all the technology and all of the tools. And humans are amazing in that regard, all the stuff that we're inventing. Right? Our science, our technology is exploding. Right? Like, you know, now we, we can have brain-computer interfaces that allow us to, uh, to uh, walk again when we're quadriplegics. I mean, it's mind-boggling. And so, in that future, the only question is, do we use it for the right purpose? Right? And Buckminster Fuller, the futurist, said, we have all the right technologies, but we have the wrong use. Right? We're using it in the wrong way. And that is our challenge. Right? We have the tools. But do we have the telos, you know, the Greek word for wisdom, uh, purpose? Yes, uh, defining what good, what is good is of course a very big topic, right? What's good for me may be bad for you or vice versa. Right? However, ask yourself simple questions like, uh, would I feel good, would my kids feel good if they didn't have a job, if they didn't have enough to eat, uh, if their civil rights were threatened? Uh, would they feel good about the world uh, if they went hungry or they didn't have any money or they could never get married or they couldn't be uh, straightforward about who they are. So pretty much all humans around the world have this understanding of some very basic things they want. Right? So that is happiness, self-organization, not dying, health, uh, so, you know, building your own career, having civil rights and so on. And if you talk to anybody in the world, you may have different opinions about what is, for example, morally right and those kind of ethics, right? But on the basic level, we all want the same thing, you know, that is to stay alive, to do well, to be happy, right? So I think happiness describes good very well, right? and happiness is also hard to define, right? And then we can say we can derive the good future by saying what is a bad future. You know, the bad future would be where we don't have any natural habitat anymore, where we are competing with machines, you know, where we are no longer capable of living, right? Because, you know, in the end, it's quite clear when we look at what's happening around us, we can safely say that technology is very good at giving us what we want, but not what we need. Right? And that is the question of good, right? We need the good. So defining that, of course, I think it's a process of saying what defines a good future. And we're on that process right now. In the COVID crisis, for example, we have come to the point where we said, you know, this is not good. Right? It seemed good before, but it's not. Our healthcare system is broken. Our politicians are stupid. Uh, we don't have a, a collective system. We don't collaborate. Right? And we went about fixing it. Right? And I think this is really important to realize. I'm saying that what worked fine for us in the industrial era and the internet point one era, you know, the knowledge information society, that no longer works because we're now in the exponential age. Right? So our benefits are increasing exponentially, but also the side effects. Right? So the side effects of bad capitalism are inequality, right? or they're disadvantaged, or racism, or and all of a sudden it turns out when we go to the turning point in the curve, all of that is starting to explode. Right? So the logic of saying it's all about profit and growth and jobs and money and being well off served us well for a while when there was so much room to go to. But now we've eaten up the entire habitat of the world, you know, the, the biomass that we have created, you know, asphalt, uh, concrete and all that stuff, that biomass has, has become bigger than the biomass of the Earth. I mean, just as an example. Right? So what worked fine before doesn't work anymore because we've gone to the top. Right? So now the only way that we can grow is like this. Right? So, and this is where we come to a different construct of what it means to build a future. The underlying economic logic is the issue. Right? 
So the underlying economic uh, logic defines what kind of school you go to, what you learn, what kind of job you have. Our economic logic is based on things that are 50 years old, and so are our schools, right? Like having a fixed job, doing a good job, being efficient, being productive, right? But the bottom line is today, you know, efficiency is for robots. We don't need efficiency. I mean, in 10 years it's over with efficiency because machines are much more efficient than we are and they will take all of our work that we do that's just about efficiency, the machines will do. So we're going to get to that point to where the, the whole construct of how we look at things is being questioned. And the underlying economic logic has been the same pretty much around the world. Growth, profit, you know, prosperity. I would say capitalism is unfit for the future. Right? Uh, I would say the current system of capitalism. Right? We have not discovered an alternative to capitalism. Uh, we've dabbled with socialism and communism, that didn't work out. Right? And then we have extreme capitalism, like in America or in Brazil. Uh, we have social capitalism, like we have in Europe. That's working out pretty well. Not easy, but works out. And then we have state capitalism that we have in China, right? basically state communism capitalism. So we haven't really found a new way of capitalism and we've talked about it for 20 years, right? Al Gore, sustainable capitalism. Paul Mason, post-capitalism. Right? The World Economic Forum. Right? And now we're at the point where we're saying, you know, if we, have, if we don't have another logic, a broader definition of what's good, then we're going to top out and basically create an impossible scenario where we do all the things just because of the GDP uh, factor, but everything else is being neglected, right? And that leads to sort of a gradual implosion. Yes, you know, on the issue of capitalism, I think it's important to understand how it has worked so far. Like, for example, you can do really, really bad things, but be very successful as a business. So this was Standard Oil, right? Microsoft in the early days, no longer now. Facebook today, right? The worst possible application to society is what Facebook is doing, but it's the darling of the stock market. Right? Uh, Aramco, the Saudi Ar uh, Arabian oil company. Right? You can do lots and lots of bad things and make lots of money because the logic of the stock market is the return is what matters. Right? But of course we know the return only goes to the top 1%. They own 47% of all stocks in the world and 58% of the equity. 40 billionaires of the, are around the world own more money than 40% of the entire population. So what happened is with the obsession on this one thing, right, is that stock markets were very good at uh, optimizing the performance of very simple rules. Right? Uh, but then again, only for a small piece of the, of the population. Right? And everything is run by this. So this is why Facebook makes $160 million a day in profit and the stock is unbeatable while everybody's saying they're killing democracy. Okay? And this is why uh, companies that make weapons and nuclear destroyers are selling great on the stock market. So what we need to do is we need to uh, turn the stock market and the markets in general into a wider approach uh, and that has been in discussion for a long time. Right? And that's for example called the, the B Company, the B Corps. Right? That, are, that have, like Patagonia, and have a wider purpose. So it's been discussed for 20 years, people plan that profit right, to expand the view. And my proposition is that we add one more thing to it. So people, planet, purpose, and prosperity. Right? Because I really think that if, if we're looking at the digital society where we are going, right, purpose is the new product. This is really what people want. They don't want more products, they want more purpose. I think what we're realizing is that, and there's been, again, lots of studies on this, you are sort of reasonably happy if you make a reasonable amount of money. So in most Western countries, that's about $70,000 a year. You are well off and you can do well. You make $150,000 a year, that's better. You do slightly better. But if you make $30 million a year, you're not 300 times better. Right? So what people really want is a certain level of where they can be comfortable and unfold. Right? 
Um, and people also in the COVID crisis have changed their worldview of saying it doesn't just matter how well off I am because, you know, the sinking tide sinks all boats and the rising tide floats all boats. Right? I can be very rich, but I'm not out of this world. Well, unless you're a trillionaire, then you can be out of this world like Elon Musk. But most people are still living in the world that other people live in. So what we need to do is to expand the view on what success is, on what makes a good society, uh, to uh, focus on people, the planet, the purpose of us, and then the prosperity. Right? And so every CEO and every shareholder only gets paid when each box is ticked. Yeah, when I talk about the focus on people, I, I mean the focus on society, people, civil society, but also humans themselves. Right? For example, we can say that a lot of technology is good to a certain level for people, but beyond that level, it becomes really bad for people. Like the mobile phone, you know, it's great for most people, right? But when you get, when you're talking about addiction or the things that you do on a mobile phone that takes you away from others, like you know, many people uh, say that today, if you ask the question, "Who's your best friend?" most kids are saying, "It's my mobile phone." Okay? Uh, and the story goes on from there. So, with a focus on people, we would say, "Well, it's not just going to be about how many people buy this." or what the consumption is, but about what they're looking for. So what we look in technology is not, technology is not what we want, is but how we seek. Uh, and so that is the important point when we talk about people, is to shift the emphasis to what's good for people. And if we assume that people aren't machines, which I think is correct assumption, then people are different than machines. You know? We need inefficiency, mysteries, lies, mistakes, surprises, you know, the, the strange things that make us human, that machines don't understand. So if we put all the focus on efficiency, optimization, you know, speed, then we lose the focus on people. And so I always say in a digital world, the more we connect, the more we must protect what makes us human. Absolutely, I think technology has all the solutions for us, but we're just not using them. You know, we're, I mean, we're spending $3.7 trillion a year in fossil fuel subsidy so that a farmer in Indonesia can actually use his truck cheaper than, than it would otherwise be, right? Which is probably good for the farmer now, right? But think about that logic. If we took that money and we had a, more carbon taxes on things like flying or meat, we could raise I think the World Economic Forum says $20 trillion a year to create 300 million new jobs and completely turn it. This is just a question of our priority. Uh, it's just like now in the COVID crisis, we said, you know, it's really important that people can go to the doctor. And so we pay for them. But we wouldn't voluntarily do that. So the thing about the planet principle is, this is like the biggest opportunity in business is the, is the, uh, the decarbonizing of our world, right? going from the fossil fuel to renewable. But it has to be kicked off by having clear rules. Right? Um, so that's kind of like when we shift priority and we want it to be better, we have to make painful decisions. That's a very good question. I think the, the the prosperity is better than profit. You know, prosperity, going back to Star Trek, live long and prosper, you know, has sort of an inclusive component to it. Right? So I prosper and maybe the people around me can prosper with me, but it's not profit in the sense of like, I get this, the cream and I walk away with that. You know? The problem that we're having with the current system is that many things are working well, but they're taking the cream off the top and leaving the rest for everybody else. So Airbnb works really well, I love Airbnb, but it's taken the cream of availability and then changing the world for everybody else that can't afford to use Airbnb. Right? So that's hardly a, a sustainable solution. And these are the kind of things that we need to fix. I think we need to start first by um, asking the question, who is in charge of the future? Um, and right now, who's in charge of the future is, mentally speaking, Hollywood. 
uh, and television and media. And in reality speaking, it's technology companies. Technology companies are telling us what the future is because it's their products that we're going to end up buying. So Facebook says, I have the Oculus Rift, with the, that's virtual reality headset, right? With the Oculus Rift, you can be in the infinite office and you can be like Tom Cruise in Minority Report, just a little bit of practice. And then if it's successful, they sell 800 billion, a million copies of it. Right? And so this is really, the question as we're looking at this is quite clear, as we see the future, we act, right? and as we act, the future becomes. And this is what technology companies do. So bringing that back into our arena and saying the story of the future should be told by us, by civil society, you know, by, by, by creative people, by the average person, not just by those that sell us products. Well, on social media, I mean, the story, the story is much simpler than that. What we do on social media is that we have become the content that's being used to sell advertising. And there's 30,000 people in the world working on addiction-based models to sell more advertising. The brightest people in the world are those that try to, tra to train us to do what they have predicted so they can sell more ads. Right? So social media isn't the answer to this. And, and how do we turn this whole thing around? Well, first, through our own actions. So stop using the companies and the platforms that create this kind of problem. Right? Buy different stock, buy ESGs. You know, don't just buy technology stocks or oil and gas. Right? You make your own decision. Stop using the products. Stop paying for it or start paying for it uh, for other products. Right? Both of those go. You make your own decisions. And uh, also uh, asking politicians and public officials to be uh, transparent and to be accountable on these issues. Right? Like, you know, you can see in New Zealand, just a great example of how that works. Uh, Jacinda Ardern is Prime Minister again and she's made some really brilliant decisions about the cause of her country. That's because of the culture of New Zealand that agrees on this is good, right? But also because she embodies all of the pieces of what can take her into the future. Emotional intelligence, understanding, communications. Right? Um, compare that to Bolsonaro or Trump, you know, you, you're clearly in a position of saying, well, there is no future for people like this. Right? So basically our choice is to vote, right? to buy or not buy, to use or not use, to ask the government to protect us when we need it, like in the case of Facebook, right? um, and to put our money where our heart is. There's a bit of a paradox as far as the choice is concerned. You know, the, uh, the paradox is when you, in reality, have uh, monopolies in the marketplace, like Google and Facebook and others, then your choice is like either suffer or use, you know? And that's not a very good choice. And last time we had that, it was the Rockefeller companies and Standard Oil and Microsoft and, and, and you know, the breakup of monopolies, right? So this is why we need regulation, clearly, in those cases. Right? It's the role of the state and the government is to protect us from the overbearing power of science and technology and industry. That's the role of government. The role of government is, is not to mingle in my private life and say, you can't use Facebook. But in reality, if I don't use Facebook, I get punished. So at that point, the, the answer is clear. I can make my own tough choice, sure. But it's the government and the, and the politicians and the policy that needs to really set this straight. It's like nuclear weapons, you know. I could have said in 1947, I didn't like what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I will not buy, you know, Westinghouse stock or whatever, right? Wouldn't have made a difference. You know, the only way we got to not having nuclear weapons is by a treaty. It took 15 years, 1967 was ratified and put into action in 1970. And that was basically what we need. So. We're going to need similar government action on artificial intelligence, on what's happening with our data, on, on healthcare that's in the cloud, on genetic engineering, on climate change. So it's always going to be a combination of personal action and then what we can get government to do for us. 
as I like to say, you know, you will not find happiness in the cloud or in an app or on a screen. What you find on the screen or in the cloud is a, a minor kind of happiness, you know, convenience of calling somebody or, you know, hedonism, uh, which is not a bad thing, but, but happiness lives somewhere else. It doesn't live on the screen. Right? So for a human to say that uh, I would prefer simulation of technology over reality, like we see in Blade Runner, the second edition, right, with the hologram woman, right, that would be a very lonely experience in the end. Right? And you can see that evidenced by the fact that social media power users are those that kill themselves the most. Right? So it's quite clear for us that, we, that this is not what's going to work for us, it's just a tool. That's like saying a carpenter falls in love with his hammer. You know, he may love the hammer, but not in that way. The picture I'm painting is humanistic, you know, and, and the fact that I believe, and I think this, there's been a lot of indication on that lately, that humans are primarily kind. You know, there's a lot of discussion about that principle questions. Uh, I really believe, as Churchill once said about Americans, I say about humans, uh, you can always count on humans to do the right thing after they tried everything else. And so what that means is that in principle we are collaborative and ben benevolent and kind, but we can be led in all different directions for that not to happen. Right? So we need to create the conditions for us to be able to bring that out. Right? And that is what I see as the good future. We have 10 years to decide on this because in the next 10 years, we're going to make principal decisions. Uh, a, a, an increase of the climate situation by two or three degrees would make Earth almost uninhabitable. So that's something we can't roll back. Creating an artificial general intelligent machine with an IQ of a billion, that could be the end of what we are. Changing our, our genome so that a rich person can live 200 years all the next 10 years. Right? So those are decisions that we make. It's not inevitable. Just like we decide that we don't want more nuclear bombs, we got together and figured it out. It was tough, but we did it. Well, right now, you know, 2021 is a very good time because coming out of the COVID crisis, uh, we have a once in a lifetime reset. You know? A lot of people are in trouble, a lot of people are worried, a lot of people are ready to make a change. And you know how humans change, it's only pain or love. You know, we don't, we don't change for without a reason. We change because we've gone through hell and then we say, oh, what the hell, may, may as well do something else. Or we change because we fall in love with an idea. Right? And right now is a reset point, like after World War II, we had this re reset point of saying, okay, start again. You know, the world is different and that is what's happening right now.